may be seated. Today's scripture lesson comes from Exodus 19, 1 through 6, chapter 20, 1 through 2, and Exodus 19, 1 through 6, and 20, 1 through 2. If you would like to follow along in your pew Bibles, that's found on page 866. On the first day of the third month, after the Israelites left Egypt, on that very day, they came to the desert of Sinai. After they set out from Rephidim, they entered the desert of Sinai, and Israel camped, out, camped there in the desert in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob, and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt, and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possessions. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. And then from Exodus 21 through 2, and God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt and out of the land of slavery. This is the word of God for the people of God. Good morning. This morning we begin uh, three weeks of looking at the Ten Commandments. Um, I thought about doing a full ten weeks. Uh, I didn't know how much to say about each commandment, but I'm probably sure we could have done 20 weeks um, now that I've started researching. Uh, when I first planned this, I was like, uh, how much can I say about do not kill? It's pretty straightforward, right? Um, but then I started reading, and I was like, oh, there's probably lots I could say. <laughs> um, but we're going we're gonna to do three weeks um, on the Ten Commandments. Um, this week, we're going to kind of set up um, the, what we call the Decalogue, uh, or the, the Ten Commandments that the Lord gave to Moses, who Moses then gave to the people of Israel, right? And then, uh, then next week, we'll look at kind of those, those commandments that are about our relationship with God, about keeping Sabbath, about keeping the Lord's, uh, you know, name holy, all of those sorts of things. And then we'll, we'll kind of flip over to the ones that are more about our neighbors, like not harming, coveting, you know, all of those sorts of things. So that's going to kind of be our pattern. But as we, we set up the Ten Commandments, I think there's, there's a few important things for us to note. First, uh, as Connie just read for us in Exodus 19, we get this long and lengthy, if you keep reading, I kind of give Connie the, the shorter part, uh, but if you keep reading, Moses continues to go up and down and up and down this mountain, hearing from God. And finally, it's at the end of chapter 19 into the beginning of chapter 20 that we hear what we know as the Ten Commandments. A uh, few things to note first. I'm going to put a chart up. I think I got it. Yeah, there we go. Uh, this chart, if you can see it, it's, it's kind of small. Um, but, but we don't all agree on what the Ten Commandments are, even though it's there, like, kind of in black and white in the Bible, right? Because, like, all things in the Bible, we like to, I don't know. We just can't agree on anything, right? So even in our traditions, we don't exactly agree what the Ten Commandments are. In, in Jewish tradition, the first commandment is what Connie read at the beginning of chapter 20, which is, I am the Lord your God, right? And so they're, they're fairly similar, but in Jewish tradition, in Catholic and Lutheran and Orthodox traditions, they kind of have their own set. And then us in the Reformed Anglican and other Protestant groups, we have our own. So you can sort of compare those a little bit. They're, they're not too different, uh, but, but you'll notice like the Tenth Commandment, um, in, in the Catholic tradition, they split that up, Right? Number nine is do not cover your neighbor's spouse, and ten is do not cover your neighbor's house, right? Or stuff. We, in the Protestant traditions, as Methodists, we clump those two together as the tenth commandment, okay? So when you hear people reciting the ten commandments, and you're like, what's commandment number six? It all depends on who you ask, okay? 
We may not number them the same. You can go off that slide. I'm happy to send that to you if anyone, uh, if anyone would like it. But, but the Ten Commandments don't just appear in Exodus either. They also appear um, in, in Deuteronomy chapter 5. And there, there's kind of a difference between what Exodus 20 and what, what Deuteronomy 5 gives us in the Ten Commandments. And, and it's mostly about the motive of keeping Sabbath. In Exodus, the motive for keeping Sabbath is based on God's blessing and will for creation. It says, For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. So in Exodus, the reason, the motive behind God giving us that commandment to to keep Sabbath is because God had blessed and consecrated that day. But if you flip over to Deuteronomy in chapter 5, the motive is a little different. It says, remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. The emphasis here, rather than Sabbath being a blessing, it's an institution of justice. It's kind of like the first fair labor law, right? Like, remember you were slaves and you had to work 24-7? You need to take time to rest. You can't work all the time. That's, that's kind of God's motive here in Deuteronomy 5. So not only do we not necessarily agree traditionally about what these Ten Commandments are, the writers of the Bible don't even seem to necessarily agree on all of it, right? Right? We find that all over the place. Like if you read the four Gospels, you'll notice they're pretty different. Okay. So, so as we dive into these, I think it's important for us to not only remember that there's some diversity of thought among traditions, there's also some diversity within the biblical text itself. Now, as I said, Moses, he went up and down this mountain, right? Right? multiple times, over and over and over again, hearing from God on top of this mountain. Do you remember what happened, though, before Moses and the Israelites reached Mount Sinai? Anybody? Nobody. (laughs) There's a big fest of bad stuff. Yeah, there's always a big fest of bad stuff, right, Chris? (laughs) They were, they were freed from captivity in Egypt, right? They'd been slaves. The people had been living under bondage of the Israelites, and they had been freed from captivity. Remember, Moses went up to Pharaoh and said, let my people go, right? Yeah, we've all seen that in the movie. And then they leave, and then they wander about in the desert for like 40 years, Right? And the people are just constantly messing up. They're, 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 they're even complaining so much, saying, oh, it would be better if we just went back to Egypt, right? But in the midst of all of this, God is continuing to talk to Moses and continuing to tell him and guide him on the right path so he can truly lead the Israelite people from a place of bondage and captivity and slavery to a place of freedom to a place full of life and hope. And so as we dive into the Ten Commandments, it's important for us to kind of set up what exactly these commandments mean. There's a pastor, his name is David Laus, and he likes to describe the relationship between the law and the gospel in the Ten Commandments by saying, remember, 19 comes before 20. Right, we all know this, unless you don't like math very much or counting, I guess. Uh, but, but 19 comes before 20, right? We can all agree with that. And so before you read chapter 20, which is where the Ten Commandments are found, you have to read chapter 19 first. You have to understand what God is trying to establish here. And as Connie read for us in chapter 19, it says, Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called out from the mountain and saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the Israelites this, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' 
wings. Before God ever hands the law to the people, before God ever says, here's the rules I need you to follow, the very first thing God says is, I want and I have formed this relationship with you. I have bore you on eagle's wings. I have carried you. I have loved you. I have freed you. As we think about parenting sorts of relationships on Father's Day, it is much easier, I have recognized, when you become an adult to listen to the advice of your parent if you actually feel like they loved and cared about you. Anybody else? And when you don't necessarily feel like they loved and cared about you, the the rules that you established don't really seem like they matter all that much, right? As someone who kind of had a tumultuous sort of relationship with their parent, I, I sometimes look back at those motivations and I'm like, uh, was that because they loved me or because of something else, <laughs> right? God is offering this, this, this very sort of same thing. He's saying, before I ever establish rules, I want you to know how much I love and care about you. Rolf Jacobson says there are, there are two crucial points about chapter 19 that, that, that's important about the law, that's important to know. He says, first, the first thing is, is that God does not give you the law as a means of salvation. You cannot use the law to earn salvation, to win your soul into heaven. That's not possible. God does not give us the law to establish the relationship. God first establishes the relationship and then gives the law. Did you hear that? It's not by following rules that you, that, you, that you form a relationship with God. That relationship is already established before God ever hands you a rule book. God loves you and cares for you even when we don't follow the law. The relationship is not contingent upon whether or not we follow the rules. The second point, Rolf says is the law isn't necessarily about us. God does not give you and me the law in order to perfect us or even to necessarily make us better. In fact, the law isn't really about us at all. The law is more about our neighbors. God gives you law, not so that you can lead a more spiritual life or you can live your best life now, but so that your neighbor can have his or her best life. If you notice in the Ten Commandments, God uses the word neighbor a lot. He says, do not bear false witness against who? Your neighbor. Do not covet your neighbor's house. Do not covet your neighbor's spouse. When it was the day of rest, make sure that all of your neighbor's from your sons and your daughters right down to your sheep and oxen, oxen get rest just like you do. Honor your father and mother who are your neighbors as well. These commandments are designed so that other people can experience the goodness of God. So that our whole society benefits. I think so often the church preaches the gospels about you and your own private individual relationship. And it's about your specific entry into heaven. And I think as we look at the whole biblical narrative, even the gospels, they're designed for the whole community. How can we be a better community, and how can we reach out and better those around us? Paul makes this exact same point when he writes to the the church in Galatia. And this is one of our scripture texts for this morning, Galatians chapter 5, verses 13 and 18. And Paul 
looks at the law found in the Old Testament, namely the Decalogue, the Ten Commandments, and Paul says it's summed up. The bottom line of all of this is one rule. Just one. Now you may say, wait, if you read the Old Testament, there's a whole lot of rules in there, right? Like about not mixing fabrics, right? Not eating certain types of meat. How can all of that come down to just one rule? Well, this is what Paul says in Galatians chapter 5, verses 13 and 18. He says, you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love become slaves to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment. Love your neighbor like yourself. If, however, you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. Live by the Spirit, I say, and do not gratify the desires of the flesh. For what the flesh desires is opposed to the Spirit, and what the Spirit desires is opposed to the flesh. For these are opposed to one another, to prevent you from doing what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not subject to the law. This is the word of God for the people of God. The law is summed up in one single commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, last week, if you were here or you listened online to Kyle's sermon, Kyle gave us all sorts of meaning for what love means, right? Gave us a whole bunch of definitions. And he talked about that agape, unconditional, fatherly, godly love that God shows to us. And so when we, when we talk about loving our neighbor... It's not just about having warm, cozy feelings about our neighbor. Rather, it's about how we treat one another with mercy and justice and compassion and care. The same kind of love that God offers to us. And I think if we back up a little bit in Paul's letter to Galatia, Paul kind of gives us a definition of what that love looks like. He said, you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your, oppor- your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence. Rather, become like slaves to one another. You know, I, I read a meme a few weeks ago that said uh, there are two kinds of people in the world. There are those uh, two kinds of people who, when they go to a pizza party, and they say, there are only 12 pizzas for all of you to share. So there's two kinds of people. One goes up and gets three pieces of pizza to make sure there's enough for himself. The other goes and only takes one piece of pizza because there may not be enough for everyone else. They both get pizza because there may not be enough, right? But one does it to benefit himself, the other does it to benefit the entire group. This is exactly what Paul is talking about. He says, you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters, but do not use your freedom for self-indulgence. I don't know how many times I hear about freedom and about my freedom, (laughs) and about what my rights are, and what I can do, and yet we could care less if that freedom hurts another person. Our freedom isn't about you. Our freedom is about all of us. You are called to freedom, brothers and sisters, but do not use your freedom for self-indulgence but rather become slaves to one another, for the law can be summed up in one single commandment, to love your neighbor as yourself. This is the exact desire that God has for us, 
The law is not to create bondage. The law is to create freedom. And truly, I believe that that freedom cannot and will not occur until we all experience the fullness of the love of God. Right? That freedom is not just for a select few. That freedom is for everyone. And that's exactly what, when God comes down onto that mountain out of the clouds and speaks to Moses as Moses rises up, God is offering that message for all of the Israelites there. Even the ones who complained, right? Even the ones who wanted to go back to Egypt. Sometimes I think it's hard for us to wrap our minds around this concept because I don't know about you, but I've never been enslaved at any point in my life. Anybody else? Okay. Uh, And most of us who are here, a a large majority, um, don't really find ourselves in places where we are less than in society. I know for me, had I been born 60 years ago, I wouldn't be able to be a preacher in the United Methodist Church, right? That's no longer true. Yet, there are still places in society where there is not equal opportunity and inclusion for all people, and that is something that we have to strongly fight for in all things because that's exactly what the Ten Commandments tell us to do. The one rule is to love our neighbors just like we love ourselves. To fight and to prosper and to be in loving and holy relationship with God and with each other. So as we continue to look at these Ten Commandments over uh, the next two weeks, um, we need to frame them with that in mind. That God told the people, I bore you on eagle's wings. That God loves us so much that these rules that are put in place are so that we can experience the fullness of the freedom that God offers to us. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, I give you thanks for all that for all that you do and all that you are, God, and all that you call us to be. God, you remind us to constantly care about others just as you care about us. God, allow us to follow your commandments so that we can live our fullest lives and so that our neighbors can experience that too. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen.